Good morning, First Methodist Sherman. I'm so glad you're all here worshiping with us online this morning. My name is Pastor Abby Eccles, and uh, so glad you're all here. We are so blessed to be here this morning worshiping. We ask that you sign in. Let us know that you are worshiping with us by putting your name in on the comments. Uh, leave us messages, and we'll be checking those as we go this morning. So at this time, let us join in the spirit together as we sing our first song. Nothing compares 
Good morning, First Methodist Sherman. It is good to be with you this morning. I know we're not here together in the same building, but this morning we're here together in heart and mind and spirit. It is good to be with you this morning. Um, we've got a lot of great things going on in this worship service this morning, but the first thing I'm going to ask you to do right now, and I already see a lot of you people are already doing it, is to sign in. And sign in on that message part in the in the Facebook thing. If you can just say, this is my name, we're here watching. I see right now, I just want to say hello to a couple people that signed in. Ron and Terry, good to see you this morning. Uh, Tom, it is great to see you this morning. Joe, Drew, Bill, Beverly, Don and Julie, um, it is great to have you in worship with us this morning. So if you will do me a favor, just real quick, just sign in on that on that message block so we, didn't, we know that you're present here with us. We are taking attendance um, through that this morning. Um, one thing I want to tell you about, if, if you want to give to the ministries of First Methodist Church, it's really easy. Um, there's going to be a link provided to you. It's in, the, it's in the message block in the top of the Facebook live stream. If you just click on that link, there's a way that you can give. Um, we're also, our offices are not closed this week. Our offices are open. Emily will be there to accept um, any tithes and offerings that come in. And so if you want to drop your gifts by uh, the church, uh, we're here. So you can do it that way also. But please, uh, please do sign in, and um, the giving link is on there. Um, one thing I do want to say, um, our sm a lot of our small groups and Sunday school classes I'm finding out are going on. They're going on through different types of media. So a lot of people are using Zoom or, or Facebook Live and, uh, and Skype and some other means of doing that. So be in, be in touch with your Sunday school leaders, your small group leaders, to see if they're doing that. I know that, like I said, I know that some of those things are already happening. And so um, we are, a lot of those small groups are still meeting um, and doing things. Um, I also I want to remind you about the youth stock sale. The youth are going on a mission trip, hopefully uh, this summer. Um, and I want to remind you to, to get those stocks in if you have um, some of those stocks you were mailed those. Get those into the office or mail those into the church uh, so we can support our youth in missions. So I'm excited to be worshiping with you this morning. I know you're going to hear a message that's meaningful and will bless your lives. Um, so we're going to let God go to work here with um, our worship service this morning. So this morning I'm going to invite Noemi up here and she's going to lead us in our virtual call to worship this morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I want to ask you to join me in the call to worship. Jesus' confidence in life after death, that confidence can be ours. The grief felt at Lazarus' death was overcome by the resurrection of Jesus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In raising Lazarus, Jesus demonstrated that death is not beyond the hope found in resurrection. We are strengthened in our, in our faith by the mighty acts of Jesus. We are given courage and confidence by the power of God to overcome our worst fears. Amen. Good morning, I'm Jeremy Blackwood, Director of Music Ministry, and I invite you to join with me in the hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Oh, 
please join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We live in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Abby, and uh, I'm the campus pastor here at Mosaic as part of First Methodist Sherman, but I am also the children's pastor. So now uh, this is our children's time. So hi, kids. How's everybody doing today? I know I can't hear you back, but you can post on the comments and let us know how you're doing. Also, parents, be sure to take pictures. You can't leave pictures in the post while worship is going on, but you can post them onto your own Facebook pages and tag us. We would love to see how you are worshiping this morning with your children surrounding you. So, um, yes, do that. Uh, we miss their faces. I know I miss hearing them. Uh, each week on Wednesdays and on Sundays. And so uh, if you would do that, gosh, we would appreciate it so much. Now for our children's lesson. So let me ask you this, kids and parents and those uh, worshiping this morning, raise your hands if you have ever felt super happy. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now raise your hands if you have ever felt nervous. Raise your hand. Have you ever felt nervous before? Okay, all right, let's put them down. Let's see, have you ever felt sleepy? Oh my goodness, I was sleepy since the minute I woke up this morning. Thank goodness for coffee, right? All right, um, but another one, how about, ooh, have you ever been scared? Have you ever felt so scared before? Okay, all right. Um, oh, how about this one? Have you ever felt sad? Have you ever been sad before? Yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt like maybe you're just a little bit alone feeling? Maybe just a little bit? Okay. Do you know that Jesus also felt the same feelings that we do? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, he felt those same feelings. You want to know how I know? Here's how I know. Because Jesus was born as a baby. Jesus cried whenever he was hungry. Jesus probably fell on the playground with his friends and scraped his knee. Did you know that? Yeah, I bet he did. Also, I bet Jesus probably wasn't the happiest sometimes. I think he was kind of angry here and there. Do you think that might have been the case? I know one story in particular where Jesus was kind of angry, right? Yeah. Do you know that Jesus was also tired sometimes? We have a story about whenever there, Jesus and the disciples were on the boat. Remember, we did this in children's worship a few weeks ago. Jesus and his friends were on the boat, and uh, the it was really crazy and scary. And Jesus, where was he? He was sleeping. What? Yeah, Jesus got tired too. Do you know that no matter how you are feeling, whether you're sad or happy or excited or angry or nervous or tired or worn out, that Jesus knows exactly how you feel. Jesus gets it. Jesus knows if you're sad. Jesus knows if you're, if you're uh, angry or hungry. 
Jesus is right there in it with you. And do you know what the cool thing is? Jesus has known it all along because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you more than words can say. Jesus loves you and knows, he knows how many hairs are on your head. That's right. He knows how many times you've smiled in one day. He knows how much you miss your friends at school. He knows how much fun you're probably having at home with your parents this week. Jesus gets it. And we can live in that knowledge and hope that God knows how we feel because of Jesus. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right. So let's pray. And uh, how about you repeat after me, okay? We say, dear God, thank you so much for helping us know that you know how we feel all the time, no matter what. We love you so much, God. We know you love us back. Amen. All right, and now this is our time of greeting. So at this time, uh, you could grab uh, a coffee warm-up or maybe uh, just say hi to the people around you. Make sure that you post online or on the Facebook page or feed that you're worshiping here with us this morning. Uh, and Pastor Denise will come forward and share a sermon with us. This morning's text comes from John chapter 11, and this is 45 verses long. This story is 45 verses long, and we're not going to read the whole story together this morning, but I'm going to lay down some really important background information before I start picking up on the 17th verse of chapter 11. Uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are all friends with Jesus, and they live in Bethany. While Jesus is away with his disciples at, at one point, uh, Lazarus falls ill and Mary and Martha send for him, but Jesus does not come to their aid quickly. Instead, he remains where he is for two extra days and then decides it's time to go to Mary and Martha. Listen now what happens uh, starting in verse 17 of this text. When he arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to consult them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. At this point, Martha goes back to her home and gets Mary and tells her that Jesus would like to see her. And so Mary gets up and goes with all those in her home who are mourning with her to see Jesus picking up in verse 32. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man had kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? When they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and he said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said these things for, the, for your sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus began to weep. It's in the middle of the text that we hear these words, and I think that these words are probably as important to us as the words of John 3.16 in the New Testament. And I think they are that important to us because the truth is, is they are shocking to us. Most of the time, we don't think about Jesus standing at a graveside weeping for a dead friend or somebody that he might have known in his lifetime. But then again, we don't like to think about grief or people weeping at anybody's graveside because grief and crying and those deep emotions that come with that make us really uncomfortable. And if we're really honest with one another, we would admit that we do not like to be uncomfortable. We don't like when bad things happen, when things seem out of our control. We don't like when the market seems to fall out from underneath us, when people we know and perhaps even ourselves are in fear of losing our jobs. We don't like to talk about a virus that shows up in all kinds of places for which there is no cure. Instead, what we like to talk about are the things that make us feel good. We like to talk about stability in our jobs and rising markets and the creature comforts that we have grown used to. We like to talk about success and courage and all of those things that make our insides swell. But, this is not a time for us to hide those feelings of grief and anxiety and sadness. This instead is a time for us to start to admit a few things that might make us uncomfortable. It might be time for us to admit that we are grieving a life that we have grown comfortable with, a life that we know we may never get back again. I was on the phone just over a week ago with my college-age son, and he was in the grocery store when he called. It was about midday, and he was ranting on the telephone. He had a very short shopping list that he had put together. There was nothing extraordinary on that list, he said, but he needed to buy a few things, and one of those things included meat. He said that as he walked around the store, he was just amazed at how poorly the people around him were acting and behaving. And then he went on to say that as he was standing at the meat area with an elderly couple standing next to him, both of them were looking at the meat that was left in the meat counter. And he said that the only thing left was the most expensive cuts of beef. And the couple next to him were talking about whether or not they could afford to buy anything at all and it broke his heart. And then as he was walking around the store, he noticed that there were mothers asking if anybody knew if there were any other diapers left in the store because those mothers couldn't find diapers for their infant children. And then he said something about the state of the world we lived in that stopped my breath, even if only for a second. He said to me, Mom, our souls have grown small. What do you say to a child, even though he's a college student, who says something like that? 
after his rant was over, he actually apologized because he realized that he was yelling on the telephone. And I'm not sure he was apologizing to me or the people in the grocery store who heard him yelling at his mother. But yet, I have to wonder about all of those things. How small have our souls become in this time of grief and fear? The truth is, is a few days later, as I was talking about this to a few other people, saying how proud I was that my son was really willing to see the injustice and the unfairness that's going on all around us, it dawned on me. I don't think that his rant was so much about the grocery store as I think it was about his own grief. I think he's actually beginning to miss being in his college classes with his friends and the professors who he had grown close to over the past few years. I think he's missing the fact that he will not have his senior year competitions. I think he's missing the fact that Taco Tuesday at a professor's home will not happen again this year. And I think most of all, he's grieving the loss of a graduation ceremony. Because like many of our college students and high school students, they will not be walking for their graduations this year. I think his grief is palpable, and I don't think he knows what to do with it. In this morning's text, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, are facing the same kind of grief. They have experienced a deep loss and they are grieving, they're sad, they're disoriented, their life will never be the same. But I think that there's another grief that Mary and Martha are also experiencing. And I think it might be something that we're experiencing as well. Notice that both of those sisters, when they go to Jesus, have the same words for him. Where were you when we needed you? Where are you, Jesus, in our hour of need? Why did you not come and heal our brother? He's the one you said that you loved. You've healed total strangers, and you haven't healed our brother. What in the world happened to you? But there's another grief in this story, if we pay attention to it. And it goes back to those words, Jesus began to weep. Now, there are volumes written about Jesus' tears at this grave. But here's why I think Jesus wept at that grave. I think if we pay attention to the text, we notice that Jesus is two miles away from Jerusalem. And even as Jesus goes to perform his last sign, to raise his friend Lazarus from the grave, Jesus also knows that he is going to meet his own death. Is it possible that those tears Jesus cries are for himself and perhaps even for Jerusalem, the city that he had cried over earlier in his ministry, the city who he came for specifically, and now he will die at the hands of those people who he has come to save. And Jesus weeps. I wonder if that might not be for us a place for us to enter into this story fully. If you think about it, Jesus never ever tells anybody to just get over it. It's okay to, to um, grieve instead of what we would normally tell some people who are just weeping and wailing, get over yourselves. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus embraces their grief, even embraces the anger that is present in their grief, and then offers them in his own grief a word of hope. What if we began to admit our grief, the losses that we're feeling, the things that are going on inside of our souls, and entered into that space and brought it all to Jesus. 
perhaps if we began to do that in this time, we would find a way to not only embrace our grief, but to enlarge our souls. Is it possible that what Jesus is offering to all of us here is a way to work through our grief and not stuff our grief down in the hopes that it never shows up again anyplace else? If we remember that we have been created in the image and likeness of God, a God who carries all the emotions, sadness, anger, joy, patience, all of the emotions that we have are God-given to us. So what would happen if we actually, in our prayer time, brought those emotions to God in prayer? Instead of just denying those emotions or saying, well, I'm okay because I'm strong. What if we brought them to God in prayer? What if we started our prayer with, God, I am really angry that I'm not going to see my child walk for graduation? Or what if we said, God, I cannot believe that I can't hug the neck of my parent, but I have to talk to them through a glass window and not even be able to touch them for weeks now? What if we said, God, I just want to see my friends at school one more time? And what if when we admitted that kind of anger and disappointment and resentment, we said to God, what are you trying to teach me in all of this? Is it possible, God, that there is some transformative gift that you have for me in the midst of this kind of social distancing? I would imagine for most of us, especially those of us who like to believe that we are in control, that it would be a little bit frightening, maybe even feel a little dangerous. But I think I have a reason for that, at least I do personally. It's because it means that I am giving up some of my will to the will of God. But this is what I've learned over the years, is that when I start to give up my control and my will to God, there is a newfound freedom in that, and there is a new reality that begins to be created all around me where God's presence is not only known in my mind and my heart, but is palpable in my life. And I think that it is the first step to enlarging our souls. Henry Nouwen, the Catholic priest and theologian, writes extensively on grief and on what he calls the blessing of grief. And he has written this in a blog that was recently posted. Nouwen says that in the midst of all this pain, there is a strange, shocking, yet very surprising voice. It is the voice of the one who says, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. That's the unexpected news. There is blessing hidden in our grief. Not those who comfort are blessed, but those who mourn. Somehow in the midst of our tears, a gift is hidden. Somehow in the midst of our mourning, the first steps of the dance take place. Somehow the cries that well up from our losses belong to our songs of gratitude. For now and, and for many of us now, we have come to understand that grief is essential to life because it opens up the possibilities for increased gratitude and joy in our lives. Grief allows us to see the world just a little bit differently as we begin to understand that we are not alone in our grief, but we walk with hundreds and thousands of others in their grief too because they too realize that God is present in the grief that they have. Is it possible that God is asking something different from us in these days, not to be self-assured and steadfast, but instead to lean into our grief and to see that the world has something beautiful to offer, even 
as our hearts are breaking. Nowin also says in some of his writings that those who have entered into their own grief are more able to enter into the grief of others and so grow in their ability to share compassion with those who are least like them. Imagine what it might look like to share compassion with those we may never have imagined walking in shoes with. Imagine if the path opened even wider for us as God's people so that we might actually offer not just compassion, but hope in these days. I believe that Mary and Martha threw all their grief at Jesus, and Jesus did indeed meet them at their point of need. He showed them what love looks like in action, what hope is in this day and this time, even 2,000 years later. And this is what I know, that grief cannot limit us. Our grief cannot limit who we are or whose we are unless we allow it to. So perhaps the lesson here for all of us on this day is that Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, is still the resurrection and the life, even in the midst of this pandemic. And this I know to be true, that in two weeks, we will celebrate Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is not stopped by this pandemic. Christ the Lord is risen, even now. And the good news for us today is this Sunday and every Sunday is a little Easter. It's a day of new beginnings, of new life, of new promises. So perhaps the best thing we can do today in this new day is to embrace the grief and the new life that God is offering to us in all of this. And perhaps when we do that, we too might find that there is a blessing in our grief. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Good morning. I'm Joe Ed Goolsby, Minister of Congregational Care here at First United Methodist Church, and I'd like to call you to a time of prayer in our service of worship this morning. And certainly as each of us uh, think of those things that are important to us in our time of prayer, we uh, immediately focus on the coronavirus and all of the challenges that it brings to us uh, here locally, uh, individually, and collectively across our world. So I would like to uh, lift up simply those persons here in our Grayson County area who are dealing with the virus on a personal kind of level. Uh, and then the anxiety and the concern that all of us have that uh, somehow we can simply stay away from it. But uh, we might all pray simply for the uh, pandemic that is uh, encompassing our world those people on the other side of the world that we don't know by name, but we pray with them and we pray for them. For those persons here locally that we know uh, that have the virus or that are simply concerned about it and we pray for them individually, let us always be in prayer for those that we know and love and those that uh, we simply know who are out there and who are concerned. We also want to pray for the economic impact that the coronavirus is having on us here locally, but also, again, for people all across our nation and our world. It is a tragedy when a young mother uh, cannot find, cannot afford to buy diapers for her child, when a young family cannot uh, be able to uh, put food on the table for their family because they've lost their livelihood. We want to pray for that circumstance as well. Those that we know personally, those that we simply know are out there who are facing that hardship and that tragedy in life. And then we want to pray for our church. Each of us would certainly love to be uh, in our place of worship on Sunday morning and be able to shake hands and, and, uh, uh, and share words of greetings with each and every one of you, but that's simply not possible as we worship today. So uh, simply remember those that you know and that you pray with and that you pray for uh, in this time of prayer. And as we think of those uh, that we want to be in prayer for, as the people of God, we simply lift them up and say, Lord, hear our prayers. But the joys that we celebrate this morning may be joys that uh, Pastor Denise was talking about in her message, joys that have come from the uh, tragedy of the coronavirus, whether it is personal and local or whether it is uh, collectively across our world. But we know of so many large and small businesses who have stepped up in this time of challenge and are providing supplies and encouragement and food and so many other things simply to help uh, uh, beat this virus that is before us. And we want to thank them and recognize that they have given of themselves uh, in a very personal kind of way and, and indeed, as I said, say thank you to them. So let's, uh, uh, as we share those thoughts and joys as well, let's lift that up and say, thanks be to God. Now, the uh, prayer of confession will be uh, on your screen, as will the word of assurance and the Lord's Prayer, as we together join in this time of prayer. As we pray our prayer of confession, you called us to life in the Spirit, Almighty God, yet we seek to satisfy the flesh. We call you gracious, yet we practice greed. We praise you with our lips, O God, yet we do not honor you in our lives. Discontent consumes us as we yearn for still more things. We know that to live by your grace promises inheritance of new life. 
redeem our enslavement to corruptible desires that we may be worthy to be called righteous in Christ. Paul declared that if the Spirit of God dwells in us, the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to our mortal bodies through God's Spirit which dwells in us. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Believe this word of promise and walk in newness of life. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now's the time for our offering um, in this church. And obviously we're not able to pass this, the plates this morning, but there are different ways, as we mentioned earlier, to give um, to the ministries of this church. You can give um, by clicking the link, the online giving link. Uh, you can go to our website and you can give that way. And you can also drop checks off at the church. But with all that being said, we want to say thank you. Um, thank you. We know these aren't easy financial times for any of us, but, but we've seen you being faithful to this church and the ministries of this church that, able, that make it able for us to go out and spread the gospel um, throughout this community and beyond. And we want to say thank you because we have seen online donations being given. We have seen checks coming through the church. Um, and uh, we give our thanks and, and gratitude to you because the ministries of this church uh, are important to you. And so we give thanks to that. Will you pray with me for the offerings that are going to be given um, this morning? Almighty and loving God, we know that, that, that all life is possible because of you. And our only response to that is to, to give and to return. So God, take the gifts, the offerings that, that will be given to this church today and multiply them so that, that your kingdom can be spread throughout this world, throughout the community of Grayson County, throughout Sherman. And it is your holy name we pray today. Amen.
And now we join together in the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. join together now in our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation. Let us join together. Receive now this benediction. Jesus already knows the brokenness inside of us, hearts that grieve. Perhaps it's time for us to just admit our humanity before God and one another. Perhaps it's time that we allow God to start the transforming work in us so that our souls might be enlarged and we might, in fact, become the blessings that we are called to be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>